in the last lecture, we took our narrative of the French Revolution to the fall of Robespierre and the end of the Jacobin Republic, or in other words, the end of the Reign of Terror. Today, we take a little break from the chronological narrative and look at two related but important issues of the role of women during the revolution and the cultural aspect of the revolution. Women played a significant role in the French Revolution. One of the abiding pictures that we have is from Dickens's The Tale of Two Cities, the picture of Madame de Faz meeting by the side of the bulletin. In contemporary engravings and paintings, we have picture of women in the barricades, in the long braid queues, and generally mixed with the revolutionary crowd during almost each of the revolutionary insurrections that we have. Another very clear imprint is that of women leading a long procession to bring back the baker, the baker's wife and the baker's boy from Versailles to Paris that really uh, at a level crystallized the revolution. Yet there is a curious silence in the revolutionary discourse about women. The Declaration of the Rights of Man virtually declared the rights of man only, excluding as it did women. Women's rights, political rights particularly, did not figure. They did not have any right to vote under any of the constitutions which the uh, revolution had drafted during this period. Some historians have detected even an element of misogyny in the revolutionary leadership. It is indeed curious that Pierre Gaspar Chomet, who had supported the abolition of slavery, did not support the right of women. He subscribed to the dominant idea of the time that women's position is in the household. Again, it is strange that he could find the link between the declaration of the rights of man and the question of the freedom of the slaves, but did not find any connection between the declaration and the rights of women. Yet there were men who did support this, who did support the women's rights, the question of women's rights. Among them was Condorcet. In 1790, Condorcet published an article in a newspaper on the question of women's rights. And he said that either everyone has right or no one has right, that women have as much right to have political rights and other kind of rights as men. But Condorcet's voice, it would seem, was a, a rarity in France during the revolution. There are women leaders. They created their own societies. They joined some of the mixed clubs and tried to create a new discourse about the rights of women. Among them, we might, might mention uh, the Dutch lady, Eta Palm Dalders. She had addressed, she had joined one of the clubs, and she gave an address, I'm, I'm quoting, when she joined the Confederation of the Friends of Truth on 30th December 1790. Gentlemen, you have admitted my sex to this patriotic club this is a first step towards justice, yet everywhere the laws favor men at the expense of women." Unquote. She was a part of a larger group known as Circle Social, Social Circle, which among other things talked of uh, the women's rights. This club, when she gave her address, Confederation of the Friends of Truth, uh, had been uh, one of the those mixed clubs, uh, political clubs that came up during the revolution. Here the women came, the women were trying to uh, not clearly uh, demand political rights, but they were raising a few issues, for example, about marriage, about inheritance. 
she was not alone in this. There were other important leaders as well. We must mention a brilliant spokesperson for women's rights, uh, Marie Gouge. She is better known by her pseudonym of Olymp de Gouge. The daughter of a butcher from southern part of France and uh, self-educated, Olymp de Gouge was a champion of women's rights and in the demanded uh, gender equality. In September 1791, she published a declaration of the rights of woman on the model of the declaration of the rights of man and citizen. Again, I'm, I'm quoting from what she said. There were several articles. The uh, article one, for example, said women are born equal and remain equal in rights with men. This was a clear assertion of her right. Article 6, for example, said, I'm quoting, the law should be the expression of the general will. All citizenesses and citizen should take part in its formation. All citizenesses and citizens being equal in uh, its eyes should be equally admissible to all public dignities, offices, and employments." Unquote. She also said that the mothers, sisters, daughters, all females want to be constituted into a new uh, assembly, a new almost a constituent or a national assembly. And finally, in the postscript, she gave the clarion, quote, women wake up, the toxin of reason sounds throughout the universe, recognize your rights. Here was a clear assertion that women must share all rights with men. Yet, this kind of clear assertion uh, forced her to pay dearly. Olim de Gouge was condemned by none other than Shomet as a shameless and unnatural woman. He again asserted that women's role is in the, in the home and it is dangerous, it is indeed shameless and unnatural, as he, he said, to be in the political arena. Olim de Gouge had to pay with her life for her uh, fearless assertion of the women's rights. All the assemblies refused to listen to the demand for granting women's rights. It's not that the women were uh, demanding political rights right away. But the women, as I said earlier, played very useful roles. They, for example, uh, during the war and the counter-revolution, they had supported the revolution. They contributed to the war effort by organizing workshops, by weaving blankets, by producing bandages. They knitted socks for the, for the soldiers because the soldiers were ill-equipped. Ill Apart from uh, Olim de Gouge or Eta Palm Delders, there were other important women like Pauline Leon and uh, uh, Claire Lacombe. They also created a, a new club known as the Society of uh, Revolutionary Republican Women. This was established in May 1793. See, at a time when the revolution was being radicalized through popular pressure, women also tried to come to the fore to assert their rights. But even during the Jacobin period, there was a neglect of the gender issues of women's issues. Men like Shomet, we had seen earlier, dismissed any notion or any idea of granting rights to women. The newspapers also stuck to the old clichés of women's position being in the household. For example, Prudhomme in, a, in an editorial asserted again this. He said, they ought to raise the family, instill private virtue and stay out of public affairs. Yet there were some who were, were uh, in, in favor of granting them rights like uh, La Juine or Pierre Guillaumar. Guillaumar in particularly said that man in the declaration of the rights of man and a citizen is a generic term. It includes women. Man means uh, granting of right to everyone. Claire Lacombe and Pauline Leon were two other very important uh, leaders, as I said. 
there were also about 60 such societies or clubs that women had uh, set up for themselves. These were spread uh, all over France, but they were concentrated as it would be only be natural in Paris. There was also a, a, a club called the Amazon Club. Here we have women who did not want rights, but who wanted to fight as soldiers. They wanted uniforms. There were, however, uh, a whole lot of misgivings about uh, women demanding these rights. Uh, a group of women indeed came to the convention and complained that some revolutionary and militant women were forcing them to wear the cap of liberty, the red cap of liberty. Several members in the assembly took exception to this and very soon the convention decreed that there should be liberty of dress. No one should be obliged or forced to do something. Then again there was a demand and this was led by uh, Amar, uh, Jean Baptiste Amar in, in October 1793 that all the political clubs and societies must be closed down. And this is precisely what happened. By the, at the end of October, the convention simply decreed that all women's clubs and societies remain closed. Now, this then is in brief the position of women during the revolution. They demanded rights but did not quite get them. It would however be wrong to believe that women did not have any role. I have told up icons, but you have the I abiding icon of liberty. For example, when liber reason was being worshipped, the goddess of reason was conceived of as a woman. Delacroix has immortalized in his painting liberty leading the people and liberty here is a woman iconized as liberty. So there was a curious dichotomy that is difficult to explain. Women did, however, play a significant role during the revolution. They clamored for their rights, at least some women did. They set up their own societies, their own clubs. They joined the mixed sex clubs. They were on the streets. They joined the revolutionary crowd and in this way were able to create a discourse of their own. Their rights were not won during that decade but they were won much later. And it would not be far-fetched to say that many of the basic questions relating to women's rights movements later could be traced back to this decade of the French Revolution. We now shift to culture. Recent historiography has somewhat moved away from the mainstream narratives of political, economic and social history to look at the cultural domain as well. The historians have used uh, such other disciplines as sociology, linguistics, anthropology, etc. to try and delineate the broader framework within which to locate the cultural shift that one finds during the uh, revolution. Emmett Kennedy, in fact, calls the French Revolution a profound cultural experience. Culture no longer meant simply cataloging the paintings or, or, or sculptures which were made during the revolution. It denoted, uh, it, it had a wider connotation now. The names of places, for example, were changed very, very, very quickly. For example, Rue de Vierge became Rue Voltaire. Ile de Saint-Louis became Ile de la Fraternité. Now, all these indicated a new ethos, a new culture that was being uh, created in the process of the revolutionary revolution being made. Revisionist historians had drawn our attention to a very significant thing the birth of a new political culture during the revolution. Lynn Hunt, for example, uh, says that the political class that led the revolution was bourgeois, but 
the broader cultural framework of the bourgeoisie or the bourgeois as a class must be understood in the cultural formation and through the language and imageries. As uh, Gwen Lewis, a recent historian, has said that the aim of the revolution was to create l'homme nouveau, a new man. Now, we, we would have to very briefly look at the dimensions of the new culture during the revolutionary period. Let us begin with religion. Now, the religious sensibility had been undergoing a process of change in course of the 18th century. The context of enlightenment was indeed very significant. Uh, it has been shown that belief was probably on the decline even before the revolution had started. But first, the official uh, approach to religion, the first attack that the revolution made was the civil constitution of the clergy. Uh, there is one historian who would call the oath that the clergy were required to take now to be a seminal event uh, even within the revolutionary decade. There was a wide regional variety in the taking of the oath. Uh, we, we had seen that the revolution, uh, uh, this, this civil constitution of the clergy virtually split uh, uh, the religious life of France down the middle. There were many who did not take the oath and many who did. There was Hebert, Jacques Hebert and his dechristianization movement. We had seen earlier in the context of the reign of terror that this was a very radical movement which uh, through the Paris Commune, for example, in Paris tried to stop all religious ceremonies even within the church. They had stopped it outside the church, they confined it to the church and then there was a move to even close down the churches. We had seen the very uh, interesting uh, incident of churches, one church being allowed only one bell and the rest of the bells were brought down, melted and converted into cannons which were needed for the war. So this was a very serious and profound secularization of religious uh, practice and belief at a level. The dechristianization movement went beyond. There was worship of reason and indeed Notre Dame was converted into the temple of prison. There was a chenier who composed the song and the, he was a poet along with composer Gossek. He composed the hymn to liberty. The hymn to liberty was in a way the new anthem. A whole new attitude was now to be disseminated amongst the people. The movement was short lived but it had cultural significance. Then we have Robespierre and his supreme being. Robespierre was against dechristianization. I am quoting from Robespierre. He explained what the supreme being was about. Quote, the real priest of the supreme being is nature. His festivals, the joy of a great people, in order to draw close to the sweet bonds of universal brotherhood. Unquote. As Gwen Lewis puts it, one could almost hear Rousseau breathe Amen uh, by the side of Robespierre. So secularization of ethics, secularization of festivals, uh, festival of reason, festival of liberty. There were numerous such festivals and this had been a part of the cultural shift that one does detect in the revolutionary decade. Mona Ozuf has said all the revolutionaries invested the educational issue with enormous symbolic significance. Kodorse was the first to propose educational reform, but his was too idealistic. Le Prétier also suggested uh, what would appear to many to be impractical, but what was being suggested was the close surveillance of the state. The state control would substitute church control. So education was also to be secularized at a level. The, the content of education would be modern. There would be mathematics, 
science, languages, civic and republican virtues. This, these are the, uh, uh, are the contents of the new curricula which were being suggested. New kind of schools were also uh, sought to be set up. There would be new uh, secondary schools. These were known as, there were some like Grandes Ecoles, like the Ecole Polytechnique, which continues to be one of the most elite institutions in France. There would be Ecole Centrale. Uh, Ecole Centrale would be for secondary education. But these were the precursors of what Napoleon introduced later, the Lycée. The Lycée system remains uh, a part of France's education system even today. Then uh, the, the system, however, that, that was being suggested was two tier. There would be one for the elite and one for the masses. A third area where one can detect certain cultural shift is in print culture. We had seen that even before the revolution, there was an explosion of printing material. It continued during the revolutionary period. We have had occasion earlier to refer to the number of pamphlets which were being uh, uh, printed and published uh, around that time the revolution did break out. It, it continued through the revolutionary decade, at least up to a, up to a time. It is very significant that this uh, period, in a way, uh, uh, signified the emergence of the author as a, an individual. The author was simply not a producer of a book, but a man who was endowed with right. And I, I suggest in this one does see the link of a market in book and the bourgeois ethos taking over. A law in 1793 gave the author the virtual ownership of his uh, uh, book. He would enjoy the, the fruits so long as he was alive and his successors would enjoy the fruits for 10 years. Napoleon later doubled this to 20 years. But at the same time, as these uh, numerous journals were coming out, we know uh, Mara's Lamy du Peuple, uh, Ebert's Le Père du Chêne, or uh, Le Vieux Cordelier by Demoulin. There was Momoro of the Paris sections, who was the official printer and publisher of the Cordelier Club. Now, they were also to experience, you know, a different kind of censorship. That ultimately, this plethora of publications obliged the government to draw a line what was to be permitted and what must not be permitted. And we know Demula, Eber, Momoro all perished on the uh, guillotine. Indeed, Napoleon even reintroduced censorship later. The Abbe Gregoire, who was certainly a Republican and, and had made on behalf of convention a survey of publications, suggested that grants or subsidies be given to publications with the right kind of cultural and political views. Finally, in architecture also there was a quest to find a new space. The new space must be in sync with the new cultural order. We have several, Boulez for example, uh, plans for creating a new space in Champs-Élysées, his plans of a grand coliseum. Uh, François Velli's project for a new city centre at uh, in Lille, Pierre Rousseau's design for uh, redeveloping Ecole de Zibozar area. Now, all this indicated that there was a shift even in the way architecture or space was being planned in, in the cities at least. Uh, but there was a return to antiquity rather than innovative creativity. As again, uh, one historian recently has said that uh, there was a degree of quote unquote modernism, but ultimately the Doric columns, the obelisk and the rotunda win hands down. This, this cultural shift from Rococo to the neoclassical was in intellectual harmony with the rational physical universe of the enlightenment. And in painting, the final point to which we come, there was the colossal figure of Jacques-Louis David. David was an outstanding painter of the period, bringing new 
and revolutionary sensibility to his creation. Tennis court oath, the assassination of Mara, you can name hundreds by, by him. And he wanted to come out to emancipation from the stultifying experience of the uh, Royal Academy. And he declared, French nation, it is your glory that I wish to propagate. Uh, he contributed significantly to the uh, cultural formation of the nation. He was also a pageant master of the Republic. And in this, we, we find that uh, he had a very important role in playing, uh, uh, in organizing the revolutionary festivals, etc. I, I may end with uh, a description of two Herculeses that we have. Hercules was being used uh, twice in the festival of unity and indivisibility of the Republic on 10th August 1793 and supreme being in 1794. As Lina sense, Hercules in the first one is a rugged and brutal figure, in the second is composed and classical in his demeanor. This indicated the political evolution of the revolution from the popular phase in 1793 to a more conventional atheist phase in the summer of 1794. The people, however, in the meantime, had been controlled as Lin Hunt puts it. Thank you.